is the NBC University Theater, bringing you the third in our series of full-hour dramatizations of modern American and British fiction. Today, with George Montgomery as our star, and with Clifton Fadiman as our intermission commentator, we present Theodore Dreiser's monumental work, An American Tragedy. seem to go a little better tonight. Six people even took tracks. Clyde, go help your father with the organ. Oh, Ma, I've got a date. Now, Clyde. Oh, why can't I go out with the other fellows once, just once? Your father and I have a mission, son. But I haven't. Kids will laugh at me. Mom, I'm not going out to the street meetings anymore. Everybody looks at me and laughs because I haven't got a jacket without big patches on it. It isn't fair. Clyde, you will help with the family's work. We're spreading the word. The Lord's word. Oh, Ma. Look, Ma, if I get a job, well, you could use the extra money, couldn't you? Well, I... Then I'd be helping the mission, wouldn't I, Ma? I I suppose so. We do need money. We'll see. Now go help your father with the organ. We've got to set out the hymn books for the evening service. <laughs> Bell, Captain? Yes, sir, 703. Right away, sir. Front point, 703. Excuse me, sir. Are you Mr. Squires? That's me. You want something? I... I the, the, the man at the drugstore was saying... I mean, he said maybe there's a place open as a bellboy. Hmm. What's your name? Griffiths. Clyde Griffiths. You come from KC? Uh, what do you folks do? Well, uh, we've, we've sort of traveled around my... Uh, father's a sort of preacher. Sort of? I mean, he hasn't got any regular church. He just, just preaches. Well, that'll be something new for a bellhop. Yeah, maybe it'd be a good thing. Okay, pick up your uniform at the storeroom. Okay, kid, I'm supposed to show you the ropes. My name's Oscar. Hi. Just keep on your toes, see? When the bell rings, you jump. When you take a guy up to the room, all you got to do is turn on the lights in the bathroom and the closet. You pull up the shades and see if there's towels in the room. You got that? Yeah. <laughs> then if they don't give you no tip, you sort of, you know, stall around a little, see? You fiddle with a transom or something. And uh, don't forget, you got to slip Squires a buck after every shift. That's his graft. Oh, I see. Front, boy! Front! Okay, Clyde, that's you. Jump! <laughs> Hey, uh, Bellhop, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, tell me, what do you do for excitement in this town, huh? Excitement? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, sir. Well, you find out for me, see? You find out and there's a buck in it for you. Oh. Maybe two. Gee, I wish I could go out on the town like those salesmen. Boy. They sure know how to live. One hotel to the next. Another skirt in each town. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the life. Ah, don't worry, kid. It's payday tomorrow. Payday. And we'll find a couple of chickens of our own. <laughs> oh, gee, I love to dance. I could dance all night. Don't you love to dance, Clyde? Yeah, with you. Ah, <laughs> oh, you silly. You're awful pretty. That's a fella's face. I don't like to see you going with those other guys. Well, Mr. Clyde Griffiths, you don't own me. Gee, I didn't mean that. You know I'm crazy about you. Honest, Hortense, you, you've got to believe me. Why, I'd do anything for you. You would? Yeah. Uh, did I tell you, Clyde, about the sweet little coat I saw in the Paris shop window? It's really the sweetest thing. Real sweet. Only a hundred dollars. A hundred dollars? Uh-huh. Well, I... I... I could arrange to get it on time. If I could uh, borrow the money. Oh, it's awful sweet, Clyde. Honestly, the sweetest thing. Uh, 
I don't like it, Clyde. I don't like it. That hotel is an evil place. A place of sin. Oh, Ma, it's a good job. Only I won't be able to give you 15 bucks anymore. But, Clyde... Well, I can only give you five. I got expenses, Ma. Yeah, that, that's it. Expenses every week. Anyway, I, I gotta buy myself some new clothes. New clothes? Well, if you're working, I suppose... But, son, remember the word when you're in that place. Remember the word. <laughs> hey, that's a hot one, Clyde. That's budget. <laughs> Let me tell you, payday comes for once a month, but when it does, wow. Well, are we going to sit here all night? I thought we was going dancing. We have to catch the streetcar. Yeah, it's getting late, Clyde, Oscar. Streetcar? Huh, that's for poor people. We're going by Cadillac. You're crazy. Ain't he crazy, Hortense? Sure. You're crazy. <laughs> just leave it to little old Oscar. My brother don't work for a rich guy for nothing. So we just borrow his boss's nice big car. Boy, oh boy, look at this baby run. Oscar, be careful. There's ice on the road and you've been drinking. Ah, don't worry, Tina. Hey, Hortense, Clyde, you two doing all right back there? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, what time is it, Clyde? About 5.30. 5.30? Hey, we're going to be late for that night shift dance. We better step on it. Boy, you sure can drive. Hey, how about turning off on 17th? Right. Hold on. Here we go. No! Oscar! Oscar, the kid! <laughs> Where'd that kid go? What happened? You hit her. You killed her. You killed that kid. Land her down. Oscar, what do we do? Hey, we got to get out of here. There's a cop chaser. He's out right in front of a car. We lost him now. One more turn. Hang on. Oscar. Oscar, are you all right? My, my arm. My... Uh, I, I'm okay. Oh, my face. My face. Come on. Come on, come on. We, we got to get out of here. Yeah, but the girls. Hortense cut her face in, and Tina's hot cold. You can't help them. You can't help them now, Clyde. Forget about the girls. A fella's got to take care of himself. Dear Mother, I haven't written for a year because I didn't want anybody in Kansas City to know where I am. I saw a clipping about the accident, so... I better not try to come home. I've got a job now bell hopping at a fancy club here in Chicago. I'm trying to save a little money so I can get into some line with advancement. Dear Clyde, we're glad that you're trying to better yourself. Your father was saying that your uncle Samuel Griffiths, of like Hergus, is very rich and successful. He has a great collar factory and hires hundreds of people. Why don't you write him and see if he could give you a position so you could learn the business? Remember his name, Samuel Griffiths, like Kyrgyz, New York. Mr. Griffiths? Mr. Samuel Griffiths? Here, boy. Mr. Griffiths? Over here. Mr. Griffiths? Telegram, sir. Oh, there you are. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, was there something else? Are you the Mr. Samuel Griffiths who's in the collar business in Lycurgus, New York? Yes, I am. Well? I believe I'm related to you, then. I'm Clyde Griffiths. I believe you're my uncle. Well, well, so you're Aza's son. Why, I haven't heard from your father in 25 years. Well, well, well. Aza's son. Good morning. Good morning.
morning, Miss Fitz. Good morning, Gilbert. Father, we didn't expect you back for days. Well, I'm not back, really. Just on my way to Albany. Dropped in to pick up the production figures. I'll get them for you, Father. Well, how is Chicago? Surprising. Very surprising. I've uh, brought back something for you, son. A cousin. A cousin? Clyde, just step in here, will you? My son Gilbert will take care of you. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, I'll pick up those papers later. You're my cousin, huh? Yes. Yes, I am. And you ought to learn the collar business from the bottom? Well, I'd, uh, I'd certainly like to start, so I might work up. I gather you've no trade or secretarial experience. Why, no, sir. Well, the best thing to do, then, is to start you in the shrinking room. Come along, I'll show you. It's not very pleasant, but I don't suppose it can hurt you. Well, come on. My dear nephew, since your arrival, my husband has been away most of the time, and now after three long weeks, he has returned, and we will be very glad if you will find it possible to dine with us next Sunday. We dine most informally. Do come if you are able. Your aunt, Elizabeth Griffiths. More coffee, Clyde? Gilbert? No, thank you, ma'am. I've had plenty, Mother. Uh, well, do you like it where you are now in the shrinking room? I, I suppose it is a start. Well, you won't be down there long, will you, Gilbert? Uh, no, no, of course not. Matter of fact, I think we'll have him upstairs starting next month. Take care of it, will you, Gilbert? Father, don't you think perhaps we ought to... <laughs> and that's enough of business, Samuel. Here come the girls. Mother, I'm sorry we missed dinner, oh, but... that's all right, dear. I'd like for you to meet your new cousin, Clyde. My daughter, Myra. I'm... Um... Pleased to meet you. This is my friend, Miss Sandra Finchley. How do you do, Mr. Griffiths? Why, Gilly does look a lot like you. <laughs> he even blushes like you. This is the stamping room, you understand? Yes, sir. You'll be in charge of 25 girls here. You're, uh, you're to behave as a gentleman. There is a strict company rule about it. Yes, I understand. Do you? These women have to be treated as employees on the job and off, so watch your step. You're only a foreman here, but understand your name is Griffiths. And we won't stand for anything that would run down the Griffiths name. You start immediately. Hey, Roberta, hmm? look at the new guy with Sarkis Gilbert. Who is he? Well, they say he's the old man's nephew, Clyde oh. Griffiths. Boy, is he giving you the once-over. Uh-oh. Gee, I wish I was refined. <laughs> Don't be silly. He doesn't even notice me. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Hey, Bert, how about Sunday, huh? Will you come with me? Oh, well, I don't know. I've never been in a canoe. Oh, there's nothing to it. Oh, come on. Have a good time for once. You only get one Sunday to a week. <laughs> Why, Miss Alden, are you in trouble? Uh, oh, Mr. Griffiths, uh, you surprised me. I've uh, got a rowboat across the point. I was just walking about. Uh, you, uh, you with anybody? Well, my my girlfriend just went away in the canoe. I, I guess it was a joke. There she is out there. Oh, I was awful scared. I can't swim at all. <laughs> well, perhaps we can turn the joke around. Suppose I roll you back. Oh, I couldn't. I, I mean, I... It's perfectly all right. You know, it's funny. That is, uh, just as I was walking over here, I was thinking about you. <laughs> I mean, uh, how you might like to come to a place like this on a Sunday. And darn if it didn't happen. Is... Is that really so? Yeah, that's the truth, honest. Miss Alden, I mean, uh, I wonder if I could meet you somewhere. You know, there's a rule that the head of a department can't have anything to do with a girl that works for him, but, well, I've been thinking that you were so awfully pretty. Oh, Mr. Griffiths, I, I couldn't. 
Besides, they're just terrible where I live. They won't let me have any company. Oh, please don't say no. There's a little park out near the Mohawk River on 3rd Street. Would you meet me out there? Where the streetcar stops? Oh, well, I'd be afraid, I think. I, well, I mean, I never did that before. Oh, you will come, won't you? 8.30. The last streetcar doesn't leave till 10. Please come, won't you? <laughs> That's the next to the last car. Gee, I didn't know it was that late. Oh, it's nice out, isn't it? Oh, beautiful. Roberta, I'm crazy about you. Honest, I am. I don't. Do you mind if I kiss you? Honest, I, I think you're the sweetest. Oh, please, Roberta. Well, I, I, I... I just gotta kiss you. Someone will come. Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh, oh Clyde. Oh, I never did this before. It's all right. It doesn't matter. Oh, Roberta, I, I do love you so much. But we have so little time. Oh, I don't know. Please don't cry. It's all right, Roberta. Roberta, say you love me. Please. I do. Yes. Yes, I do. It's all right now, Roberta. Oh, please don't cry. Oh, you're so sweet. So awfully sweet. Oh, Clyde. Darling. getting cold, isn't it? Yes, winter's almost here. Oh, it doesn't seem right. I mean, well, these months have been so nice. Yeah, all the places we used to go to are closed up now. We've got to figure out something. You can't be seen with me. That old factory. Well, we can't just walk around freezing on the street every night. Bert, couldn't I visit you at your house? Nobody needs to know. Oh, but they're so strict there. You can't, Clyde. Well, it just can't go on like this. Anyway, there's there's no one at home now. They wouldn't have to know. But that would be terrible. It it wouldn't be right. All right, then. If you don't want to, you don't want to. I'm glad to know that you care more about what people think than you care for me. And if you don't love me any more than that, well, we, we might as well call the whole thing off right here and now. But, Clyde, you can't mean that. No, why not? Oh, I'm fed up, Bert. If you're too scared to be with me, well, then goodbye. Please don't go, Clyde. Please don't. I do love you, Clyde. There's been a mistake in the stitching room, Mr. Griffiths. These, these collars are wrong. A mistake, Miss Alden? Clyde, you've got to believe me. I do love you. Truly, I do. Ah, very bad mistake, Miss Alden. I cried all night, and you haven't looked at me for two days. Oh, Clyde, don't leave me alone. I'll meet you tonight if you like. Where? On the street corner again, I suppose? Oh, no. No, anywhere you like. Well, maybe I might. The others are watching. Be careful. Oh, Clyde. Eight o'clock then. And after we'll see. Oh, Clyde, I'm so happy. I'll do... I'll do anything. But don't ever leave me again. <laughs> You've got to go now, Clyde. They'll be home soon. Meet me again tomorrow. Oh, darling. I'm so glad I don't have to worry now. I don't have to share you with anybody. Don't worry, Bert. <laughs> I wouldn't even look at another girl. Oh, I've got you now. <laughs> snubbing me? Oh, hello. Hello, Miss Finchley. Oh, it's you. I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Griffiths. I thought it was your cousin Gilbert. I suppose we do look alike. I uh, didn't mean to intrude. Oh. oh, don't go away. Can I drive you anywhere? I'd rather give you a lift than Gil anyway. He quarrels. Well, I was going downtown. Well, then hop in. Thank you. We don't see you often at all. The crowd must see more of you, Clyde. I'll have to scold Myra. 
Yeah. Well, I, I'd enjoy it very much. Well, then it's a promise. You won't let your factory duties get in the way? No, will you? But, Clyde, you promised. I can't help it, Bert. This dinner at my uncle's just came up. But I'm going home next day for Christmas. Oh, Clyde. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Bert. But you've been breaking dates all winter. Oh, well, I don't really mind, only I wanted to give you your present then. Well, I, I've got yours here. A comb and brush set. Oh, oh. I, it's lovely, Clyde. Lovely. I got a pen and pencil set for you. You sure you can't see me Friday? Look, I told you. I've got to go to that dinner at my uncle's. Oh, now, don't feel bad, Bert. I... I love you. I love you terribly, Clyde. I'm glad you could come tonight, Clyde. Oh, I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Hey, you're awfully pretty, Sandra. <laughs> you think so? I I just got to tell you, I'm crazy about you, Sandra. Oh, We'd better keep it a secret, don't you think? Yeah, I was all jealous when I saw you dancing with the others. You're cute, Clyde, real cute. Let's go outside. We can see if it's snowing. Outside? Yes. <laughs> yes, I guess we can see if it's snowing. your birth, there's a meeting of the department heads. I can't go with you. But, Clyde, I've got to see you now. I've got to. What's the matter? Why are you so frightened? Clyde. Clyde, it's so terrible for me if it's so. If what's so? What is it, Bert? What's happened? You're, you're all trembling. But you said if, if anything went wrong, you'd help me. What's wrong? Bert. Clyde, I'm scared. What? No, no, not now. Can you be sure? Oh, you'll be all right, won't you? No. No, I'm sure. Oh, Clyde, what can I do? It's, it's so awful. It's wrong. Well, I don't know. You've got to go see the doctor, I guess. Oh, Bert, of all the times. <laughs> it's all right, Bert. I'll, I'll figure something. Look, you'll go to the doctor alone, see? I mean, there's there's no sense in his knowing about us. You'll go alone. Do I have to? Yes, yes, it's the only way. Tell him I... Tell him that man ran away or something. Then maybe he can help you. Understand? You've got to go alone. say the young man has run away? Yes. He... He ran off when I told him, Doctor. You don't know where he is? No. I... I just don't know what to do. My mother... My father... I just don't know what to do. (laughs) Well, young lady, I earnestly advise you to do nothing further wrong. A physician may not interfere in a case of this kind unless he's willing to spend ten years in a prison. You'd better go home and see your parents and confess. There's nothing I can do. Nothing. I'm sorry. Oh, honest bird, I'm beat. I don't know what to do. Well... I've been thinking, Clyde. I don't see any any way out of it unless unless you marry me. Well, I... gee, Bert, that's all right for you. It fixes everything. But how about me? I haven't got any money. All I've got is my job. If it comes out that I was going with a girl from the factory, they'd fire me. But, but the longer we wait, the worse it is for me. We, you can't leave me to make out all by myself. We, you can't. I won't let you. 
I don't ask you to marry me forever. You can leave me if you want after, but... But, Clyde, you, you can't just push me off by myself so that you could still go on with your society, friends. Calm down, will you, Bert? But, You're all excited. You used to be with me all the time, and... But now I, I just have to beg. What is it, Clyde? Those society girls you're always talking about. That Bertine Cranston, or, or maybe that Sandra Finchley, or, or who? No. No, you're all wrong, Bert. It's only... Well, everything happened so fast, it's... It gets you pinned down. But there must be some way, Bert. There, there's got to be. <laughs> What's the matter, Clyde? You're all clouded over. Oh, oh, nothing, nothing really. I thought the ride might cheer you up. You've been so jumpy. Well, I, I guess it's just from working too hard. I don't know. Well, anyway, you've got to promise to spend your vacation with us at the lakes. I, I'd like to very much. I want to have you specially, Clyde. You do? Uh-huh. See, you plan to spend the vacation with us. And don't you dare let anything come in your way. <laughs> don't you dare. <laughs> I've got to quit work at the factory, Clyde. Quit? We can't wait much longer. Clyde, you've got to marry me. How could I face my mother and my father? You've just got to. Oh, it'll work out some way, Bert. I'll figure something. Just give me a little more time to figure some way out. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you George Montgomery as Clyde Griffiths in Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, the third in our series of full-hour dramatizations of outstanding works in modern American and British fiction. And here to discuss today's novel is our intermission commentator, the distinguished author, lecturer, and critic, Mr. Clifton Fadiman, speaking to you from New York. When the author of An American Tragedy died, the critic Howard Mumford Jones wrote, The death of Theodore Dreiser removes from the American scene something primary, brooding, and enormous. It's as if a headland had crumbled and slid into the sea. That's true. And the words primary, brooding, and enormous are well chosen. Dreiser is a primary figure in the American novel because he stands at the head of something. American naturalistic fiction flows in part from Dreiser. Brooding? Yes, he was that too. Obsessed all his life with the tragic lot of man, convinced that against the immensity of the universe, we poor humans are less than grains of sand, yet creating out of our very littleness something large and monolithic. Enormous. That he was, too. Dealing only in large subjects, such as the theme of an American tragedy. Of an American tragedy. Dreiser had no charm of style. He had sad defects of intellect. But he had something more elegant writers often lack. He had bulk. Also, he had a patient, unsentimental compassion for people born of his own struggles in the face of a world that had censored his books and attacked his character. Dreiser's deficiencies, like a warrior's wounds, are eloquent of struggle. The struggle of one who, before he became the leading novelist of his time, had scraped rust from second-hand stoves, driven a laundry wagon through ice-glazed streets, washed dishes in a stifling Greek lunchroom. Out of his brooding came an American tragedy. What was Clyde's tragedy? Not that he rebelled against the established order and was punished, as in a Greek play. No, rather that he pathetically accepted that established order's worst dogmas, its crisis ideals, its most pitiful superstitions, the worship of wealth and petty social position. 
The lesson Dreiser drove home in 1925 with heavy, clangorous strokes is one that's still relevant today, a generation later. Yes, we're a whole generation away from an American tragedy, and at this late date it's easy enough to list Dreiser's deficiencies, but it's more difficult to recollect that but for him we might not possess the insight enabling us to list them at all. If Dreiser had not battered away clumsily, humorlessly, at Puritanism, would our battle against it have been even half won? To hack a path through the dense jungle of American life as it appeared, let's say, at the turn of the century, was no job for a thin-skinned writer. Forests are cleared, not with razors, but with broad axes. And such a broad axe was Theodore Dreiser. Our dramatization continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. See, he must have tipped over, folks figure. Can you imagine a nice young couple like that drown? Come on, Alberta. It's perfectly safe. It'll turn over so easy. But I'm so scared, Clyde. I can't swim at all. Two hats floating on the water. <laughs> they had to fish for them. Clyde, Clyde, come with me. Hurry up, Bert. Get in the boat. It, it's the only way. Sandra's calling me now. But, Clyde, you said that you'd marry me. I know, but... This way, no one will ever know. Nobody knows who she is. The girl was drowned. Oh, Clyde, I'm so scared. Never did find the fella. Come on, Clyde, come with me. <laughs> Don't you dare let anything get in your way. I'm coming, Sandra. Bert, get in the boat. But I can't swim. I can't swim. She was swim. drowned. I can't it's swim. Drowned. I can't swim. It's the only way. It's the only way. It's drowned. I can't swim. Drowned. It's I can't drowned. swim. It's the only way. It's drowned. <laughs> <laughs> <It's laughs> drowned. <laughs> Dream. Oh, how could anybody even dream that? Why, why, she wouldn't even go down. She could hang onto the boat. You'd, you'd have to hit her. Oh, up on that lake, nobody'd see you. Just a little accident. I'll, I'll bet when I'm married to Sandra, I'll have plenty of money. Oh, if Roberta would only... What the devil am I thinking? I better get to sleep. I... Got to stop thinking this way. Oh, I've just got to. Dear Clyde, I can't stay here any longer. I'm so afraid you won't come, and I'm so frightened, dear. I just can't wait any longer. I'm coming back to La Kyrgyz, Clyde, and you've got to do something. Or I'll just have to come out in the open and tell everybody. Oh, Clyde, you were so nice. And I'm so miserable now. Listen, Bert. Can you hear me? Yes, Clyde. I can hear you. Well, listen carefully. You meet me in Fonda, see? Then we'll take the train to Utica. Yes, Yes, everything will be all right. I, I, I promise. That's right. We'll be married up at the lake. Now, don't worry, Bert. I'll, I'll arrange everything. Yeah, there she is. Down at the end seat. Same old brown hat and blue dress. She doesn't look anything like Sandra. <laughs> How could she look like Sandra? Oh, I've got to go through with it. I've got to be free. He looks worried back there. Oh, but it isn't my fault. It isn't anything I could help. When we're married, maybe he'll be like he used to be. There'll be the baby, and 
I'll be Mrs. Griffiths. Oh, God, I wish you would love me the way you used to. Maybe up at the lake things will be better. It's so beautiful. Everything's bound to be all right up at the lake. Peaceful here, Clyde. You, uh, you didn't see anybody you knew in the inn, did you? Why, why, no. Clyde, we will be married today, won't we? Uh, I said so, didn't I? It would be so nice, dear. No more worries. No. No, no more worries. Oh, the sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Lots. Oh, Oh, Clyde, look down into the water. The sun can't even shine through. It looks so cold. So awfully cold. For heaven's sakes, Roberta. (laughs) Hey, what the devil? That bird. We must have startled it. Oh, it feels so nice in the sun. And everything's over. All over. Oh, Clyde. Roberta. Roberta, don't. I... Oh, God help me. I... I can't do it. Clyde, what is it? What's the matter? You look so strange. I... I... I, I can't. What's the matter, darling? What's the matter? Roberta, leave me alone. Sit down. What? What, what is it, Clyde? He, let no. me help you. No, what? don't touch me. No. Sit down, Roberta. Please sit down. I... Roberta. Clyde! I... Same age as my own. Yeah, not much doubt it's a murder. Poor little girl like that. All cut across the face. Well, could have hit herself on the edge of the boat. Yeah, maybe. Then why didn't the fella hang on to her? Maybe he drowned too. We just haven't found his body yet. Well, and I don't think we're going to find one. Captain Silver of the lake steamer says he had a young fella come aboard at Three Mile Bend carrying a suitcase. And he answered the description perfectly. A fellow who'd kill a pretty little girl like that, well, he's bound to lead us right to him. Oh. Mm, She looks so peaceful. Ralph, we're going to get that fellow. Get him and see him in the chair. the idea of not coming up here till now. I'm very angry. Sandra's been furious all weekend. She wouldn't even go to the club dance last night. Well, I, uh, I couldn't get away from the factory, you know. Sure, that mean old factory. We're making up a set of tennis this afternoon. How about it, Clyde? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. What's the matter? You look like a banshee was sitting on your shoulder. Loosen up, Clyde. Laugh. I'll be all right, Myra. Uh, tennis sounds swell. I'll, uh, I'll have to borrow a racket, though I... I forgot mine. Well, come on, Sonny. We've got to get our racket. Meet you in ten minutes, Clyde. So long. So long. Uh, hold on there, mister. Your name Clyde Griffiths? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, my name is Hine, sheriff of Katarake County. You're under arrest. I suppose you know what for. Why? Why, no, I... No, I don't. <laughs> you want to question him, Orville? Yes. I'm Orville Mason, district attorney... If you're smart, Griffiths, you'll confess right now. You'll get off lighter in the end. Well, I... Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I... I didn't do anything. Uh, all right, Ralph. Just put the handcuffs on him. Oh, you poor fool. You left a trail behind you wide enough for a blind man to follow. You poor young fool. <laughs> All right.
right now, Griffiths. We've got letters from the girl to you that we took from your room. You still deny you knew her? I won't say. She had a comb and brush set in her bag with your name on the card. Come on, boy, the truth. Well, yeah, sure I knew her, but but I didn't kill her. It was an accident. That's it. The, the boat turned over. That's all. She she hit her head on the edge of the boat. You can and... swim? Sure. Sure, but I, I was afraid. Afraid she'd pull me down. How about that straw hat? What hat? The one on the water. Well, the wind blew it off. That's how the boat turned over. See, the, the wind blew the hat off and... I, I I reached for it. Yeah, we found it floating. Suppose you tell me where you got the other straw hat, the one the captain, uh, the boat captain saw you wearing afterwards. The other? Well, I... You I... bought it, didn't you? Put it in your bag just so you could leave the other one in the water. No. No, I, no, I found it up at the lake. That's it. I've been up at the lake once before. Uh-huh. So... You found it up at the lake. All right, Ralph, take him back downstairs. <laughs> Klein, I'm your lawyer. Lawyer? Name's Belknap. Alvin Belknap. It's all arranged. I... Well, what am I going to do? Well, first you'll tell me what happened. I don't want any stories now, Clyde. I want the truth. Yes, sir. And in the meantime, I want you to try to laugh a little. Smile. There's an old saying in law that consciousness of innocence makes any man calm. It's a lot of hokum, but it impresses folks. Now... Let's have your story. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, let's get this straight. You changed your mind when she was in the boat? That's the truth, Mr. Belknap. I, I didn't mean to. I, I couldn't. She came at me in the boat, and, and I guess I threw up my hands. That's all. That's all I swear. Well... <laughs> They can't hang a man for bad intentions. But we'll have to figure out some line of defense. You say this Sandra Finchley encouraged you. Could we say she sought out, bewitched you? Oh, no, sir. She wouldn't do that. But we love each other, I'm sure. And when Roberta said I had to marry her, I... Well, I was, I was afraid to tell her about Sandra. You've been afraid of a lot of things, haven't you, son? Uh... I don't know what you mean. You mean you, you don't believe what I said? No, Clyde. I believe you understand. But there are a lot of things in your story that ordinary folks will have a hard time swallowing. But, but it's the truth, honest. I know, but there's different kinds of truth. The best thing we can do now is figure out a kind of truth that the jurors can believe. <laughs> Before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the State of New York, Connie Kotarki, draw near and give attention. This court is now in session. State of New York against Clyde Griffiths. The people are ready. The defendant is ready. Very well. We will proceed to impanel the jury. Simeon Dinsmore. Simeon Dinsmore. We are ready, Mr. Mason. You proceed with the case for the people. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, the people of the state of New York charge that the crime of murder in the first degree has been committed by the prisoner, Clyde Griffiths. We shall prove the willful slaying of Roberta Alden, and we shall ask the extreme penalty for this vile act. Now, if it please the court, I shall call the first witness for the prosecution. I seen him come up to her room. They thought I wasn't there. But I'd like to check up on my boarders. Yes, sir, that's him, all right. She told me several different stories, but naturally I refused to perform any illegal operations. She gave her name as Howard, but I recognized her as Roberta Alden from the picture. And then I heard the scream, a woman's scream. 
We couldn't see nothing. We were in a boat around the point. But that scream sounded like a soul being cast down to the depths. I can still hear it, I can. And there you are, ladies and gentlemen. We have drawn you a picture of a scheming, cold-blooded murderer. Wrote to this cold, scheming betrayer. And, ladies and gentlemen, I shall now read to you from those letters found in Griffith's own room under lock and key. Listen to the words of the murdered girl. Clyde, if I would only die... That would solve all this. But if you mean what you have said, if we will get married up at the lake, you don't know what it will mean to me. Goodbye, Clyde, until I meet you as you telephoned. And forgive me all the trouble I have caused you. Your sorrowful Roberta. Your Honor, the people rest. Gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Mason has told you Clyde Griffiths was a grown, brutal, ruthless killer. And yet there he sits, two years younger than the girl he is accused of murdering. Gentlemen, the district attorney has woven a web of thin and spidery evidence, but there is an eyewitness to the death of Roberta Alden... The only eyewitness. And I call Clyde Griffiths to the stand. Now, Clyde, you mean when that car in Kansas City was wrecked, you ran away? Yes, sir. Even though you knew a child had been killed? Well, I I was afraid, I guess. You were a coward, weren't you? A moral and mental coward. I... I guess so. Now, Clyde, you really loved Roberta at first. Yes, I... I suppose I did. But then you fell in love with... We've agreed to leave her nameless with Miss X. Yes, I did. Did you go and tell Roberta that you were no longer in love with her? Did you break off your relationship? No. No, I... I guess I was afraid to. Cowardice again. Moral and mental cowardice. And now, Clyde, tell us about that trip to the lake. That trip the prosecution has magnified and distorted until it resembles... Your Honor, I object. Counsel is using his questions to make improper speeches and... Sustain. Find yourself to questions, Mr. Belknap. Very well. Well, Clyde. Well, I... I never meant to kill her. Never. I just thought, well, I just thought maybe if we went away for a few days, I could calm her down. You still were in love with Miss X. That's right. But I couldn't tell Roberta. I I, I just couldn't. Then that afternoon on the lake, she was talking about getting married, and she was so sad about the baby. Well, well, I I thought I'd better go through with it. Then you did intend to marry her. Yes, sir, I did. Then your whole course of action, your relations with Roberta and with Miss X, were marked by consistent cowardice, mental and moral cowardice. I I don't know. It was like I said. But I didn't kill her. I I didn't push her off the boat. I I couldn't do that. Well, I, I just never, never could. Thank you, Clyde. I believe you. Now, gentlemen of the jury, you have the facts. Robert Alden died tragically, but accidentally. No, Mr. Mason has not shown us murder. But what has he shown? He has proved Clyde Griffiths is a weakling. He was not fair to Roberta Alden. He was a coward. But many men... Many of us here are far more cruel in love than this boy ever thought of being. Gentlemen, you cannot condemn a man to death for that which he cannot control, his inner soul, 
his entire character? Clyde Griffiths was made by us, by all of us, by all of America. If you condemn him, you condemn his makers. Your Honor, the defense rests. reached a verdict? We have. We find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Yeah. Mr. Belknap, they can't. They can't. Uh, it's all right, Clyde. We'll appeal it. The whole trial was shot through with prejudice. We're sure to get a reversal. Quiet. Quiet in the court. Remove the prisoner. I will pronounce sentence Friday morning. Remove the prisoner, please. <laughs> Guards, a new customer? Welcome to Murderer's Row, kid. In here, Griffiths. Yes, sir. You behave yourself, Griffiths, and everything will be all right. Hey, new man, what's your name? <laughs> Leave me alone, will you? Can you beat that? The new guy is crying. He's crying like a baby. <laughs> You'll get over that, kid. You'll get over that fast. <laughs> All right, you guys, quiet now. Now, uh, okay. Pull the curtain. What's that? What's going on? Take it easy, kid. They pull that curtain across so you won't see that long walk. Bert goes tonight. You won't see nothing, but you'll hear it. Them footsteps down the hall, that minister praying. Then you hear the door slam. Shut up, will you? You'll hear that door slam, and you'll see the lights go down. You'll see. <laughs> you'll see. Clyde, how are you? Ten minutes. I, uh, I've got bad news for you, Clyde. The appeal. They... Denied. They can't. They can't. I... There's nothing to say, boy. Hey, who wants to play some chickens? Oh, shut up, will you? Mr. Bellman, they can't kill me like that. They can't. I didn't kill Roberta. I, I couldn't. I meant to. I meant to when I took her out in that boat. I had to get her away somehow. I was going to marry Sandra, but but I didn't kill her. Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell. I, I tried to, but I couldn't. I'm not guilty. They can't kill me. They, they can't. The governor wouldn't commute the sentence. Your mother sent him a telegram. I'm innocent, Mr. Bellner. They're, they're not really going to kill me. I'm not really. Oh, my God, my God. All right, Griffiths. No. Come on now. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Humble Come on, Griffiths. Under the mighty hand of God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to the loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. Curtain falls on the third in our new series of full-hour dramatizations of outstanding works in modern Anglo-American fiction. Today, the NBC University Theater has brought you Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy and starring George Montgomery in the role of Clyde Griffiths. George Montgomery can currently be seen in the Ben Boges production, Girl from Manhattan. Today's cast included Lynn Allen, John Daner, Noreen Gamil, Ralph Montgomery, Tony Barrett, Grace Lennard, Jean Layton, Hugh Thomas, Paul Fries, Dick Anderson, Gloria Grant, Lynn Whitney, Larry Dobkin, Ted Von Eltz, Clark Cuny, Bob Bruce, Jim Nusser, Earl Keane. Our intermission commentator was Clifton Fadiman. Productions of the NBC University Theater are currently being used in conjunction with a course in Anglo-American fiction at the University of Louisville under a national college by radio plan which permits our listeners to earn credit toward a college degree by means of radio and supplementary study. If you wish to obtain full information on how you may take advantage of this plan, write to the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Next week at this time, we turn to the work of a British author as the NBC University Theater presents its dramatization of the H.G. Wells novel, The History of Mr. Polly. Your director was Andrew C. Love. Original music for an American tragedy was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. This program came to you from Hollywood. Tonight, there's the biggest entertainment bargain yet. Two and a half solid hours of fun on Sunday. Start with Ozzie and Harriet, then laugh straight through with Jack Benny, Phil Harris, Alice Faye, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Fred Allen. For the best time of your life, the best time is tonight over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.